Welcome to Rockstock channel and our first video in about six weeks. We took a short break after producing more videos than usual at the start of this year. After a week skiing in Utah in late February with my family in which I was heavily distracted by the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I met up with a number of clients at the BMO conference in Florida, but came back with COVID. It was a relatively mild case, but it resulted in some brain fog. During this period, I also learned of the devastating news that Vincent Mascolo, managing director of RK Equity Client Atlantic Lithium, suddenly died of a heart attack. I had spoken to him just 36 hours prior in preparation for his planned visit to the United States. He was in an absolutely ebullient mood, focused on a series of positive milestones over the course of 2022. Before I get into today's video, I'd like to recap some of Rodney and my overarching narratives. First, commodities and commodity equities are good inflation hedges. EV battery metals are largely commodities and present a win-win to play both the EV thematic and the commodities as an inflation hedge thematic. Second, lithium is in a structural deficit as far as the eye can see. Demand is so strong, supply will not be able to keep up. Whereas chip shortages have dominated the headlines in the past year, battery cell shortages and battery price rises are here, principally due to shortages and price rises of battery raw materials. Third, as a result, already robust M&A and partnering activity will accelerate with higher prices paid for quality assets. M&A activity will include new investors, with deeper pockets than the industry has witnessed before. Could Elon Musk's Master Plan 3 result in buying Albemarle? Let me know what you think in the comments below after watching today's video. Benchmark Minerals returned to in-person conferences last week in Germany, coinciding with Tesla Berlin's Gigafactory opening. Simon Moores highlighted that raw materials costs are now 80% of battery costs, up from 40% in 2015. Pippa Stevens of CNBC flagged Bank of America research showing lithium rising to 13% of battery cell costs, while nickel will account for a full 21%, up from 12%, despite a much smaller rise in nickel prices relative to lithium. Following our recent video about nickel with Matt Fernley, we will follow up soon with a discussion of Talon Metals, which recently signed a supply agreement with Tesla and was featured in a separate CNBC piece last week. Rockstock Channel's February video, Higher Love Again, argued, as we did last July, that retracing lithium equities in the face of rapidly rising lithium prices, which hit 50000 in February at the time of that video, presented a dip-buy opportunity. Lithium chemicals have since risen above $70,000, another 40% rise in just the past six weeks. Atlantic Lithium and Frontier Lithium, which we profiled in January as part of our equity overview with Rodney Hooper series, achieved all-time higher love last week. Piedmont Lithium, which we argued in February was pricing its flagship Carolina Lithium project at zero, a lithium freebird, has risen 50% from $50 to $75, significantly outperforming its advanced lithium developer peers. Piedmont took the opportunity last week to raise $130 million in fresh equity. As we expect M&A activity to likely accelerate, we believe the re-ratings of Atlantic, Frontier, and Piedmont have further to go over the course of this year, as do many of the less well-performing companies we've profiled in our videos, newsletters, and on Twitter. As a reminder, Rodney and I are not financial advisors nor broker-dealers. This video is for information purposes only and should not be considered investment or financial advice. Please do your own independent research and read the disclaimer at the end of this video or on RK Equity's website. If you like this video, please remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell to be notified as soon as new episodes are released. And if you are finding value in this free content, please consider supporting our efforts by sponsoring us on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Rockstock Channel. Elon Musk flagged a forthcoming Master Plan 3 focusing on scaling to extreme size and will include sections about his boring mining endeavor. Morgan Stanley's leading auto analyst, Adam Jonas, suggests that reconfiguring the EV supply chain could feature in Master Plan 3. He wrote, in our view, the winners in the EV market will be those with the ability to buy the commodities in the highest volume and be guaranteed supply. 
unlimited capital is also a critical ing ingredient. Recent events are accelerating the trend of supply chain security, resiliency, and sustainability in a radically restructured way versus the conventional just-in-time model of today's Auto 1.0. We couldn't agree more with this and have been saying so for some time. COVID alerted the world to supply chain vulnerabilities and accelerated policy support for EVs from a climate perspective. Now, the Russia-Ukraine war is accelerating supply chain fears from a national security perspective. Russia's Norilsk Nickel is one of the few major entities not subject to sanctions due to its criticality as a supplier of 20% of the world's class one nickel. Russia's weaponization of gas exports to Germany and other EU countries is accelerating the long-term move toward renewables and away from fossil fuels. When Ford announced its 11.4 billion Blue Oval SK battery plants in Tennessee and Kentucky last year, I suggested that these plants alone will require 100 to 125,000 tons of lithium hydroxide, equivalent to three to four projects the size of Piedmont's Carolina Lithium Project a few hundred miles away. I suggested Ford could return to its Fordlandia roots in the late 30s and 40s when it owned rubber plantations and iron mines to ensure supply. I showed that Ford could save $25 billion over 20 years if they could produce and sell to themselves at $7,500 cost rather than pay the prevailing $20,000 per ton of hydroxide from an external supplier. With lithium prices now three times higher or more, the financial savings and strategic logic is order of mag magnitude larger. Battery grade lithium procurement presents a single point of failure that could bankrupt some tier one auto OEMs, which is why I believe we will see an acceleration of strategic OEM partnering and potentially outright purchases of lithium development companies. More analysts like Adam Jonas and Morgan Stanley recognize it is security of supply that is paramount. And if the expected savings is now 50 to 75 billion over 20 years, taking over the growing list of tier one lithium unicorns for 2 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion, or even 10 billion will likely make sense. Now to Albemarle and why I think it could make sense for Tesla to buy the company for its lithium assets. Albemarle is the world's largest lithium producer and possesses the largest, lowest cost lithium assets. It produces the widest range of lithium products from the most diverse sources of supply in Australia, China, Chile, and the United States. Albemarle is already a major Tesla supplier, but like any company not wanting to be too beholden to any one customer, Albemarle is focused on supplying other tier one auto and battery OEM customers and is unlikely to want to supply Tesla with more than 30 to 40% of its production. Albemarle produced 88,000 tons of lithium chemicals in 2021, but will only grow their production to 200,000 tons by 2025. Tesla is focused on attaining extreme scale at a time that Albemarle, having been burned by price declines in the very recent past, has been showing market discipline in how fast it brings on supply. Tesla has accelerated its lithium supply sources from developing mining companies recently signing deals with Liontown and Core Lithium. It is notable that, in contrast to some of its peers who have signed offtake agreements with unconventional lithium projects, that these new Tesla agreements are for plain vanilla spodumene in Western Australia, mirroring the strategy it started 18 months ago with a spodumene supply agreement in North Carolina with Piedmont Lithium. Albemarle is highly complementary to Tesla's geographic footprint. It has a dominant position in Western Australian spodumene, controlling 50% of green bushes and 100% of Wajina supply, the two largest spodumene producers. Through its joint venture with Mineral Resources, it will likely also secure access to Minres's half share of Mount Marion. Albemarle also controls the high-grade Kings Mountain Spodgemine Mine in North Carolina, for which Albemarle recently paid $40 million to secure adjacent land as part of a potential restart of that past producing asset. Albemarle's world-class La Negra operations in Atacama, Chile are an important global carbonate supplier, which is relevant as Tesla grows its LFP production for standard range vehicles.
Tesla could buy Albemarle for, say, 30 to 35 to $40 billion in stock and cash, equivalent to just 4% of Tesla's market cap. It can then sell off Albemarle's catalyst and bromine business for about 10 to $12 billion, lowering its net purchase price. Based on Albemarle's scheduled ramp, Tesla could save $30 billion per year in lithium procurement costs on 200,000 tons by 2025 and a whopping $125 billion per year by 2030 on 500,000 tons. As lithium costs drive up battery costs and EV costs, owning Albemarle's suite of world-class lithium assets and selling itself lithium for $5,000 to $7,500 versus buying it from Albemarle and Piers for five times that amount would further entrench Tesla's already massive moat and potentially give the company a permanent sustainable competitive advantage relative to its peers. By purchasing Albemarle, Tesla could take 100% of Albemarle's output for itself rather than compete with its peers for supply. It could speed up Albemarle's timeline in Australia and China to meet Tesla's extreme scale aspirations. It could redirect some spodumene from China to Tesla's hydroxide operations in Texas or in future in Berlin to localize supply for Tesla's gigafactories in those geographies. Tesla could likely improve the low yields Albemarle is getting in the Atacama by using DLE technology more aggressively. Tesla could speed up the development timing of Albemarle's world-class Kings Mountain mine in North Carolina. And Tesla could leverage Albemarle's technical team for Tesla's clay pursuits and unconventional brines like Al Albemarle's Magnolia Arkansas facility. There are a number of considerations why Tesla might not buy Albemarle, and I've listed a few here. Albemarle's long-term supply agreements would mean that Tesla would be supplying its competitors for some period of time. Tesla may confront antitrust issues, but with only 20 to 25% market share, I don't think this is a huge issue. And if so, perhaps Tesla could sell off Albemarle's Atacama Chile operations. The corporate culture of Tesla and Albemarle are probably not a great fit. Albemarle is a bit bureaucratic versus entrepreneurial Tesla but I don't believe this is an insurmountable hurdle. Mining risk could impact Tesla's brand and image. Tesla would be a big target in the event of an environmental failure. That said, as Elon has made manufacturing products cool, so too can he champion mining and chemical engineering. Tesla, as the most sustainable company in the world, could have massive influence on these topics with the public and governments. Chile would more than likely roll out the red carpet in hopes Tesla could build further downstream in country, as China has for Tesla in Shanghai. Albemarle, at 26 billion market value currently, is relatively richly valued for a commodity-style company. It is trading at nearly eight times its trailing 12 months, 3.3 billion in revenue. Tesla is one of only a few companies for which an Albemarle purchase could make immediate financial sense from an earnings multiple perspective. Theoretically, a battery company like LG or SK or Panasonic could do it, but that would be a tougher cultural fit, in my opinion. Big mining or big oil are currently minting cash, but I think they would likely find it difficult convincing their boards that an Albemarle purchase would be accretive given the market values of these companies are at incredibly low earnings multiples. Rio Tinto earned 80 times more than Albemarle did in the last 12 months, yet its market cap is only five times as large. I've said before and will again that a Rio purchase of Livent for say $5 billion is more likely. Rio recently entered Argentina and Brine for the first time with its acquisition of Rincon from Sentient, so Livent skills could be greatly helpful in Argentina and Brine technology. Auto OEM's valuations are also too low. Albemarle would be too big for Ford or GM to swallow. Both have market values of just $64 billion. Let that sink in for a moment. Ford had $137 billion in sales in 2021, which is 40 times larger than Albemarle's, yet their market caps are less than three times as big. All this may change. I believe Rio Tinto and many other large commodity plays are poised to re-rate over the next one, three, five, and 10 years as we experience another commodity super cycle. This could narrow the earnings multiple disparity with Albemarle. I strongly believe that Albemarle will be bought sometime in the next five years. A famous commodity market top last decade was Rio Tinto's purchase of Alcan in aluminum in, 20, in 2007. 
The balance of pricing power is now squarely with the producers of battery raw materials. Lithium is potentially the single point of failure that could prevent Tesla from meeting its 50% plus annual volume targets over the course of this decade. Tesla could preempt what I believe is the inevitable takeover by a larger mining oil or chemical company with a five-year view. So could a stealth buy of Albemarle be a component of Master Plan 3? Let me know what you think in the comments below.